speaker, um, Caroline Smith. She is from UK. So Caroline, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, you can have the floor. Okay, can you all see that? Okay, so good morning, everybody. My name is Caroline Smith. I am originally from Richmond, Kentucky, and I'm getting ready to start my fifth year of my PhD at the University of Kentucky in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biochemistry, where my research focuses on targeting oncogenic phosphatases in pediatric cancer. So I am gonna be getting into a little bit of some hardcore biochemistry, so bear with me. Um, my project specifically for GMAP has explored something that our lab normally wouldn't have the tools to look at. So um, I've been utilizing something called nanobodies and epitope mapping to discover new therapeutic binding sites on this oncogenic phosphatase, PRL3. And it's known that PRL3 is expressed in advanced and metastatic lesions of solid tumors that often arise disproportionately among members of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds, such as breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and liver cancer, as well as several types of leukemia where it's linked to poor patient prognosis. And PRL3 works by dephosphorylating its substrate in order to upregulate pathways involved in all of these different types of cancer. But there's been a very large lack in our field in terms of tools and inhibitors that can be used to study this protein as well as target this protein in all of these types of cancers. And there's lots of difficulties in terms of developing new tools to look at PRL3. The first is that PRL proteins are highly homologous. So there's three different members of this family and they all have a very similar sequence to one another at approximately 80% identity. So when you're targeting PRL3, most often in the field, you also end up targeting the other proteins in this family, which is not ideal. And the PRL binding, catalytic binding pocket is both shallow and hydrophobic, making it hard to distinguish not only from the other PRLs, but also phosphatases across the board. And what becomes difficult in this scenario is we don't really understand the normal function of any of the PRLs. And so when you target one and end up targeting multiple PRLs, you don't actually know what's going on inside of a cancer cell, if you're affecting it or not, and what kind of downstream effects it could have in these different types of tumors. So what my project has focused on is developing a new tool to study this protein in order to target it in multiple types of cancer, and that's called a nanobody. So you're probably asking me what that even means. And so it's well known in our field that conventional antibodies um, that are made in humans and other animals like mice and rabbits are about 150 kilodaltons in size, and they contain both heavy and light chains. Whereas um, nanobodies are derived from single domain or heavy chain only antibodies. And these are made by cartilaginous fish, like sharks, as well as members of the camelid family, like alpacas and llamas. And these antibodies differ because they lack light chains and um, only have one heavy chain region. And nanobodies come in as this is the variable region of these antibodies derived from the camelid family. And they're only about 15 kilodaltons in size and have a very highly stabilized structure. And they're about 10 times smaller than conventional antibodies, which allows them to reach binding sites on proteins like PRL3 that these larger structures might not normally reach. And this allows them to have a high specificity and affinity for their antigens. So our goal was to make a nanobody that could specifically target PRL3 over other members of the family, as well as over other phosphatases in general. So the way that we made these was by I was able to express and purify PRL3 from bacteria. And our protein core in the biochemistry department at UK was able to inject this protein into alpacas where they would produce these anti-PRL3 nanobodies. And they could harvest the B lymphocytes in order to generate um, the DNA sequences from these nanobodies and put them into a phase display library so that I could then perform phage display against PRL3 to hopefully only pull out nanobodies that would bind to PRL3 and nothing else. 
And so from this large initial screening, I was able to sequence 32 potential antibodies. And through multiple validation approaches, we now, before I started my GMAP, had narrowed it down to seven nanobodies. And I'll just walk you through a couple of those. So the first was protein purification. Some of our nanobodies would not purify in bacteria, so we could immediately eliminate them from our study. This is one that was purified by both nickel chromatography as well as size exclusion chromatography. The second, we wanted to confirm that, PRL, that our nanobodies were specific to PRL3 over one and two. So I was able to plate our protein on an ELISA plate, probe with our nanobodies, and then use a secondary antibody to a HIST tag because all of our nanobodies have a HIST tag on them that could then be detected by a colorimetric change. So a larger absorbance reading means that our nanobody was more binding more to that protein of interest. And you can see that our, this nanobody was binding much more to PRL3 than it was to PRL1 and 2. And then finally, we also wanted to confirm co-localization of our nanobodies and PRL3 being expressed at the same sites in the cell. So I overexpressed GFP PRL1, PRL2, or PRL3 in a colorectal cancer cell line, and then probed with our nanobody of interest as well as a secondary antibody that would fluoresce in the red channel. And what you can see in this figure is that our nanobody signal is only detected whenever PRL3 is overexpressed, but not with the other members of the family. And you can also see in this overlay that the nanobody and PRL3 co-localized together within the cell showing specificity um, when expressed in cancer cells. So at this point, we knew that all of our seven nanobodies were specific to PRL3, but we wanted to determine how tightly they bind to PRL3 and which ones have the highest affinity. So to do this, I wanted to define the KD of our PRL3 nanobodies using biolayer interferometry, which is a pretty simple system. It uses a biosensor that you can couple to any antibody of your choice. And I used a HIST tag antibody because all of my nanobodies have this tag on them, so they would bind together. So BOI has five different steps, and it's a readout of binding as a function of time. So our first step is a baseline step where you're just equilibrating your histagged antibody to the buffers that you're using. And then the second is a loading step where you can incubate your nanobody that has a tag on it with your histag antibody so that it becomes saturated. And then you do a third baseline step so that you can get rid of any of this um, leftover nanobody that's in your system. And then finally, you can do an association step. So you can measure um, how quickly it takes PRL3 to bind to your nanobody of interest as a function of time. And this calculates your Ka. And then you can also do a dissociation step to see how long it takes PRL3 to dissociate from the nanobody to calculate Kd. So I did this for all seven of our nanobodies at six different concentrations of PRL3 in order to cal calculate a global affinity for each. And what we came up with is ultimately that first, all of our nanobodies bind to PRL3 in the same region that um, conventional antibodies in the market would, uh, would be for multiple types of cancer in the nanomolar range. So we decided to move forward with nanobodies 19 and 26 because they had the highest affinity for PRL3 or the lowest KB. And then we also wanted to move forward with nanobody 91 because it was the most commonly made nanobody by the alpacas. So clearly there's some either evolutionary advantage or some type of advantage that this nanobody has because it is continually being made by these alpacas over other options. So now that we knew which antibodies we wanted to move forward with, we now needed to look at where they bind to PRL3 because the ultimate goal is to see where they bind, if it's a new binding site that could potentially inhibit the protein and be targeted in all of these different types of cancer that PRL3 is overexpressed in. So I started working with a collaborator at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy to perform hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry. So I'll walk you through how that works. So when you have a protein normally, so we'll call this PRL3, it's normally covered on its outer surface in hydrogens. 
and you can exchange these with a molecule called deuterium to cover the surface in deuterium. And then you can quench and digest this system in order to break your protein down into multiple peptides that can be read on mass spec um, to look at different areas of your protein. But you can also do this whenever PRL3 is complexed with our nanobodies. And so the theory is that when these two proteins are binding together and you do your deuterium exchange, deuterium will still cover the surface of the protein except where the two proteins are binding together. So when you do your quench and digest, you can see that now you have all of these different peptides that are either deuterated, only covered in hydrogen, are covered in hydrogen or deuterium. And when you do mass spec, you see shifts in those peptides that are now covered in hydrogen instead of fully covered in deuterium. And you can analyze this as deuterons as a function of exchange time in order to see where a difference in deuterium exchange is, is occurring. And that's most likely where our nanobody is binding to PRL3. So our collaborators, Daniel Jurej and Kyle Kinn, um, performed this for us at the University of Maryland. And so what they showed are areas of decreased deuterium uptake, which is most likely where um, our nanobody is binding to PRL3. So these are these dark blue sections on the protein, as well as areas of increased deuterium uptake, which is most likely where the protein is being destabilized. And one interesting thing that they saw is that our nanobody seems to be, apply, be binding to PRL3 on this surface, whereas the active site where other substrates would usually bind is this gray area represented here. So this may be an option as an allosteric inhibitor or a binding site where future therapies can be developed. And they further defined where these areas are specifically based on the protein sequence. So this just represents that um, specifically between amino acids 13 and 19 is where we're seeing this destabilization event whereas between amino acids 63 to 79 and 132 to 146 is where um, we're seeing those decreased uh, deuterium uptakes. So these are the specific peptides where P our nanobodies are binding to PRL3. So in conclusion, what I've learned thus far is that our anti-PRL3 nanobodies bind to PRL3 in similar ranges to that of antibodies on the market and currently being used in clinic. And our HDXMS experiments demonstrate at least two epitopes for nanobody and PRL3 interactions. So my current and future studies are focused on using X-ray crystallography, which is a more in-depth way of looking at protein structure to understand the full scope of PRL3 nanobody interactions with the goal to one, see how nanobody um, binding changes or stabilizes PRL3 conformation. We want to see if it can either stabilize the protein, change its function, see how it affects it overall in order to identify new therapeutic binding sites on the protein to hopefully have new drug targets that can be used in clinic for um, all the cancers that PRL3 is overexpressed in. And with that, I will take, a, oh, whoops, one more slide. Um, I wanted to thank my mentor, Dr. Jesse Blackburn for allowing me to explore an avenue that our lab normally wouldn't look at and just for all of her support over the last five years. And I would also like to thank our collaborators, both at um, the University of Maryland, as well as the University of Kentucky and our core facilities. And finally, um, all of our Region 1 North um, staff, Dr. Evers, our principal investigator, Dr. Dignan, um, our project director, and Dr. Oakley, our regional co coordinating director. And with that, I will take any questions. So Caroline, simply outstanding. I'm blown away by your presentation. Even though being a molecular biologist and biochemist myself, the way you presented made it so simple. These are very complicated state-of-the-art methodologies and technologies, and you explained it so beautifully. Okay. Uh, I am so glad to hear this. This is phenomenal research, developing nanoantibodies, and uh, you guys uh, are just doing stellar job. Um, I think it has a lot of implications in terms of early detection biomarkers for cancers. So these antibodies are just treasure trove. 
And uh, this is phenomenal research. And uh, that's what the GMAP is trying to do, to fund uh, those high risk, high reward pilot projects, which can be taken to the next level. So I don't know whether you guys are thinking about using SBIR approach, which could be a contract mechanism and developing patents for these antibodies and in terms of generating resources. This is phenomenal. This mm -hmm. is outstanding. We actually submitted a patent application in October of last year. And it has been a very interesting process that I did not know anything about beforehand. <laughs> but it's been very fun to learn. <laughs> Phenomenal, phenomenal. Kudos goes to your, all the mentors and the, our GMAP leadership here. Phenomenal job. So you, you, I think these are four or five PhD theses. You don't seem to, it's incredible amount of work. So because I know challenging developing these antibodies and looking at various epitopes in silico models and you have done phenomenal job. Well, thank you. Outstanding job. Thank you. Okay, does, um, does anybody have any questions?